Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to join you tonight. I'm really excited to talk to you, um, not only because I love talking to people about biology and ecology and sea otters, um, but also because Año Nuevo is one of my favorite places. And I feel very fortunate to live so close by and to get to go there for work pretty frequently. So um, as Susan said, my name is Colleen and I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Our office is in Santa Cruz and our office is called the Marine Wildlife Veterinary Care and Research Center. Um, and our office was formed in, um, or it was opened in the late 90s, basically in response to the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened in Alaska in 1989. Basically, California said what happened in Alaska with respect to there, no, there being no pre-established facilities for treating oiled wildlife um, can never happen in California. And so they, so California passed some legislation that mandated um, having a, a plan for oiled wildlife in the event of a large spill. So our facility was built as the primary care facility to care for oiled sea otters in California, should we ever need to use it. And um, so that might explain the, um, the acronym OSPR, the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. So that's the group within the Department of Fish and Wildlife that I work for. And our primary goal is to be prepared for dealing with oiled sea otters at our facilities. So we do a lot of trainings and drills. We write protocols. Um, and luckily, because we don't have oiled sea otters on a regular basis, we spend the rest of our time doing research on sea otters and doing things that help make us better prepared to deal with uh, uh, oiled otters during a response. So that just means learning as much as we can about them so that we can treat them more effectively during the event of a spill. Um, our, um, our center does a lot, um, has a big focus on mortality investigations. So we do necropsies, which are basically animal autopsies on um, primarily sea otters and seabirds at our facility. And so um, a lot of what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is um, focused on mortality um, factors and branding response. But some other aspects of my job include population monitoring. Um, I do uh, capture uh, of wild sea otters for tagging studies um, for, and like health and population monitoring. Um, and then I do some of the, the tracking for those animals after they're released. Um, and then I'm part of the stranding response team. So uh, I'm mostly a field biologist, which means I'm outside a lot, which I'm sure all of you guys can appreciate and relate to. And um, that's why I love my job so much. Um, but that's just a little bit of a of background um, about me and our facility. We are located on the um, Coastal Marine Science Campus for UC Santa Cruz, so out near the Seymour Center and Long Marine Lab. So pretty, um, pretty close to Anya. And um, I'm going to dive right in here. I'll start by giving you a roadmap of where we're going this evening. I'm going to start with just giving you some general sea otter information, um, some tidbits about their biology and natural history, um, tips for identifying um, sea otters, uh, the population status, and some of the mortality monitoring information. And then I will go into some information specific to the otters at Año Nuevo, including their estimated population size, diet, and what I found with the, the animals that have been stranded from that area. And I will finish up with sharing with you the reporting protocols if you do find a stranded sea otter uh, in, on, at Año Nuevo or, or anywhere else in the area. And I invite you, as um, Susan said, to put your questions in the chat. And I'm going to try to limit my talk to about 20 minutes or so. So we have plenty of time for question and answer and discussion. So some general information about sea otters is that they produce one pup a year, starting uh, at age three to four years, and pups are born year round. And this is a question that I get a lot is when is pupping season? When is breeding season? And the reality is that you can see sea otter pups in central California year round. So that's really cool. 
And it's really different from a lot of other marine mammals. As you guys know, most of the pinnipeds have synchronized breeding and, um, and that's because of their breeding strategy. You know, pinnipeds are typically mating on land. And so they all need to come on land around the same time of year um, to, for that breeding to happen. But sea otters mate in the water and they're not on that annual synchronous cycle. Females have a six month gestation period and that includes a two month delayed implantation. So it's two months of delayed implantation and then four months of fetal development. And then the pup is with the mom for about six months on average. And so that really does keep them on a fairly consistent yearly cycle for that individual. But again, that timing is not synchronized among the different females. Another thing you guys probably know about sea otters already is that they have the densest fur of any mammal. And that is why, as you guys probably know, um, they were almost hunted to extinction. So I'm sure most of you guys know the history of fur, hunt, uh, fur traders uh, hunting sea otters all around the Pacific. And, um, and it was because of this, this fur that was so, uh, got, you know, was so, um, what's the word um, that I'm thinking of? Uh, it was, you know, fetched such a high price. Um, but of course, it was, it's incre incredibly important for the otters to keep them warm because unlike pinnipeds and other marine mammals, they don't have blubber to keep them warm. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And there's two types of um, pelage that the sea otters have. Um, the adults have, um, have one type of pelage and then the pups are actually born with a natal pelage. And you guys may, have, may, may be familiar with this with the element, elephant seals are born with a lanugo coat. Um, but in, so the, with the sea otters, it's not exactly the same, but they do have a pup coat that, um, that they're born with that makes them look really woolly and fuzzy. And it is so buoyant that it actually pre prevents them from diving or sinking. They just float like corks up the surface. And the reason for this is so when mom is diving and foraging for food, um, the pup will, will stay at the surface and, um, and she can find it again when she comes up. And um, the pups will start shedding um, that pelage after several weeks and it'll usually be fully shed by 10 to 13 weeks of age. So even, um, even when they're still with their moms, um, they'll, they'll be losing that, that natal pelage. And by the time they wean, most of that pelage will be completely gone. So another, um, another difference between uh, sea otters and other marine mammals is that sea otters primarily eat benthic invertebrates. So these are mostly sessile invertebrates or um, that live on the ocean floor or, or active um, invertebrates that live on the ocean floor. Um, as compared to a lot of pinnipeds that eat fish, um, and, and mostly forage fish. So there is a little bit of overlap in diet in that um, both can eat squid, but other than that, there's not a whole lot of overlap. Uh, there's been over 75 different species of invertebrate documented as part of the sea otter diet, and it's everything you can think of from kind of the most the iconic things that you think of sea otters yeah. eating, like sea urchins and abalone, and even things that you probably wouldn't think of them eating, like snails and octopuses. So um, a whole variety of different prey items, even sea stars, which don't look very tasty to me, but um, they'll eat them sometimes. And of course, the sea otter is unique in its ability to use tools to open their prey. And they do this uh, in two different ways. Sometimes they'll use, I'm sure as you've seen, like a rock, um, on their chest to help open prey, but they'll also use a rock or other hard object underwater to remove prey from a, from a rock um, or or you know or pry it up. And they do this quite a bit with abalone. Um, they'll use the rock, the tool underwater, so you can't see what they're doing. And what we see with a lot of sea otters is that they specialize on prey. So there will be two or three different prey items that they're really good at catching and we'll see that as a, a the majority of their diet and we see that more in areas where sea otters have existed for a long time and there's more than and there's a lot of sea otters in that area and therefore resources are more limited so it's beneficial for them to specialize in different prey so 
they're not competing with all the other otters in that area. They're only competing with the other animals that eat those specific prey items. And as I talked about um, a little bit in the previous slide, I mentioned that sea otters have, um, have dense fur to keep them warm because they don't have blubber. They also produce heat by metabolic heat loss. And so they have a high caloric requirement so that they're metabolized using all that food and producing extra heat to keep them warm. Another cool thing about sea otter foraging is that they bring their prey to the surface to consume it, which is really handy for us as biologists because it allows us to see what they're eating and, um, and how successful they are on their dives. They are not particularly impressive divers when it comes to marine mammals. I mean, you guys know elephant seals are so amazing with how deep they can dive and how long they can stay down. And some, um, what, some studies of wild sea otters that had time depth recorders uh, instruments implanted told us that the average depth of a sea otter dive in California is only 24 feet and the average duration of the dive for, um, for a foraging dive for a California sea otter is only about a minute. But that's, those are the averages. There have been some slightly more impressive records. Um, the deepest dive that was recorded for a California sea, line, a sea otter was 264 feet, and the longest dive recorded was nearly eight minutes. Now, sea otters also have some group dynamics that are pretty different from a lot of other marine mammals. They, uh, as you guys know, they probably, uh, you as you've probably seen it, Anya, they can form dense groups. And these are typically um, sex segregated. So if you see a big group of otters, it's probably a male group or a female group. And if there's, a, if there's pups in the group, one or more pups, it's definitely a female group. Now the female groups may have one male in the group as well, and that would be if there's a territorial male around. So that's the only case where there would be a mix, typically a mixed sex group. Um, the animals can also be solitary, especially young males that are, after they're weaned, um, they are not gonna be in a position to compete with a territorial male where the mom, uh, where their mom, um, was hanging out. So they'll typically take off and, um, and be wanderers for, for quite a while. They can uh, travel incredibly long distances and uh, tend to be a little bit solitary or sometimes will move with other juveniles. Um, speaking of movements, um, there's a lot of variability between the sexes on their movement patterns. So females have what we call high sight fidelity, which means they have a pretty small home range and they'll tend to stay in the same place. And we really uh, learned about this during, some, during the 1980s when sea otters in California were trans, a, a handful of them were translocated to San Nicolas Island down in Southern California. So they were captured on the mainland around like Morro Bay and Monterey and they were moved to San Nicolas Island. And a large percentage of those animals, most of which were female, swam right back to where they had been captured. So that was a big wake up call to biologists at that time and allowed us to figure out that these animals have a really strong homing instinct. And subsequent studies have shown that most females stay within a kilometer or two of kind of a, the nucleus of their home range. Males, on the other hand, are the wanderers. So unless they're holding a territory, in which case they'll also have a, a small home range during that time, um, they can travel hundreds of kilometers. For example, we've had some males that were tagged in Santa Barbara, uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel around like Point Conception, um, that would do regular trips up to Morro Bay and back. So they can travel really, really long distances. And there are some exceptions to this. And in fact, I'm gonna talk about one animal who is an exception to this, who happens to like to come spend her fall and winter at Año Nuevo. And I'm gonna talk about her at the end. So um, just some quick um, sea otter ID tips. Most of the time, um, you know, you're seeing these animals in the water live, a lot of their behavior and, and just how they look in the water is gonna um, cue you in to what animal you're looking at. 
But um, a lot of what I deal with is dead animals on the beach. So I think it's helpful to review some of the key characteristics that help identify a sea otter as a sea otter. So one is that they have paws in the front. So paws on their forelimbs, kind of like very similar to a dog paw. Um, unlike a pinniped that's going to have flippers as uh, the forelimbs. Um, they do have flippers on their, their hind limbs, but they're much shorter than, um, than certainly a sea lion and even a, a seal or a sea lion. They also have a long and dorsoventrally flattened tail. And this is another key difference. So as you guys know, seals and sea lions have a really short tail that's much, much shorter than their flippers. But a sea otter tail is going to extend to the end of the flippers or even beyond the flippers. And they also have extremely specialized dentition. And this is because of the prey that they eat. Um, you know, they're eating really hard shelled uh, prey that they need to crush. If they're not crushing it with a tool, they're crushing it with their teeth. And so they have really flat molars in the back to crush that food, but they do have pretty good size canines at the front. Um, for biting and protection as well. So you don't wanna be on the receiving end of a bite from a sea otter. They have incredible bite force. And um, I wouldn't recommend putting your, having your hand or any part of your body anywhere near a sea otter mouth. Now I've, uh, I've only been talking, or I've been talking a lot about sea otters in California. And I will just mention that there are three subspecies of sea otter and, uh, the one that I'm talking about today is the Southern sea otter that exists here in California. The other two species are the Northern sea otter that is found in Alaska, Washington, and British Columbia. And there's also a Russian sea otter that's found in parts of Russia and um, even in Japan. And we don't know a lot about the Russian sea otter. There are some studies and there have been some surveys, but the there haven't been any uh, standardized population surveys in, in many decades uh, for those animals. For the northern sea otter, um, there's actually dis dis distinct stocks that are managed, um, managed separately, and they have varying statuses with regard to whether they're increasing, decreasing, or stable. And I'm not going to go too much into that um, now, but if you guys have questions about that, you can let me know. I will mention though that historically, sea otters range around the entire Pacific Rim from Japan to Russia, over to the Aleutian Islands, down the coast of uh, the mainland through British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, and all the way down into Baja, Mexico. So um, the Southern sea otter, as I said, is a distinct subspecies. And all sea otters in the United States are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's different from other marine mammals, um, particularly the pinnipeds and cetaceans, which are managed by NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service. But a few marine mammals, including manatees, polar bears, and sea otters, are managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we work really closely with them um, to help provide data to them and um, and talk about various management issues. The Southern sea otter is listed as threatened on the endangered species list. And it's also a fully protected species in the state of California. We monitor the population of Southern sea otters on an annual basis in May of every year. And we do a combination of ground-based counts with big spotting scopes from cliffs. And for the areas where we can't see out far enough to, um, to cover all the shallow water, basically, that's going offshore, um, we conduct aerial surveys in those areas to get a, a complete count of the sea otters. And during our last complete survey in 2019, we counted about 3,000 individual animals. And the range of the, the geographic extent of, um, of the, that population is currently from about Pigeon Point in the north to Gaviota in the south. And actually, I'll go back and I'll show you that here on this map here. So you can see that Año Nuevo is very close to the northern range end of the, the current range of sea otters. And, but it hasn't always been that way. So the population that we have now 
are all descendants from a small group of sea otters that luckily survived the fur trade and were rediscovered by biologists and local residents in Big Sur in the early 1930s. And those animals, as they uh, be, once they became protected, they reproduced and started expanding. And this figure just shows, the figure on the right, just shows the northward and southward expansion of otters along the coast over time. And I know that the numbers are a little bit hard to see there, but basically it shows the kind of the sequential expansion north and south from the 1930s to the early 2000s. And we haven't really seen much expansion in the population since that time in the last 20 years or so. It's basically been um, around between Pigeon Point and Half Moon Bay in the north and around Gaviota in the south for the last 20 years or so. All right, so um, one of the reasons that the range has not been expanding is partly because, I'm gonna actually go back a minute, partly it's because of our linear coastline. So if you think about some other places where sea otter exists where their population is increasing, like Southeast Alaska, you have a lot of islands that are really close together and close to the mainland there. There's basically two dimensions that sea otters can move. They can move north and south, and then they can also move east and west. And we've seen that areas that have that more two-dimensional coastal habitat and a lot of islands nearby really seems to facilitate expansion of sea otter populations. But in California, they pretty much have the option of going north or south. So it's very one dimensional. And when you have barriers to expansion in either or both of those directions, it becomes challenging for them to naturally expand their range. So one of the factors that we utilize to monitor uh, population dynamics is mortality. And we try to look at what animals are dying of and use that information to help understand why the population is not growing. And we accomplish our mortality monitoring by a team of different agencies and organizations that are shown here on the screen that are part of the Southern Sea Otter Stranding Network. And as a team, we respond to every report of a live or dead stranded sea otter that gets um, called into us. For the live stranded otters, um, it's a collaboration between ourselves, and um, the Marine Mammal Center and Monterey Bay Aquarium. So we coordinate with each other to get the animal picked up and assessed, and it will either go to the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium or the Marine Mammal Center for evaluation by a veterinarian and potential rehabilitation and release back to the wild if, if they're in uh, good enough shape for that to happen. Um, for animals that are collected dead or strand alive and die or have to be humanely euthanized, um, we want to learn as much as we can from those animals. And so we collect, uh, we conduct postmortem exams called necropsies to try to understand why those animals died. And we have two different levels of exams that we conduct. Um, the field level exam is a basic exam where we're taking morphometric data and trying to determine the primary cause of death. And on a subset of animals, we do more detailed exams where we try to figure out everything that's going on with that animal. So not just the primary cause of death, but any contributing causes of death or incidental findings to really understand what's, um, what's happening with the health of that animal. And to give you some perspective of how many animals we examine, the, um, the record year that we had about five years ago, we examined over 470 sea otters. And in recent years, it's been about 300 a year. So it keeps us pretty, pretty busy. And the ma majority of, of those exams are conducted at our facility. And that's um, a big part of my job is conducting the field level exams and helping with the detailed exams um, along with our pathologists. And so I didn't, um, I didn't go too much into the different causes of death or the causes of stranding. And we can certainly talk about that at the end um, if folks are interested in that, especially within the context of the demoic acid um, bloom that seems to be happening right now and affecting pinnipeds. So I'll definitely, I'll get back to that at the end. And we can talk about some of the, 
the common causes of stranding that we see amongst the whole um, sea otter population in California. But first I wanna shift over to some more information about the animals at Año Nuevo specifically. So um, the Año Nuevo sea otter population started forming around 1987. So if you remember back to that figure that I showed that had the, the expansion of the animals uh, north and south from Big Sur, they hit Año Nuevo around 1987 and they've stayed there ever since. During our, um, our, our annual census counts that we do every May, um, I looked back at the last seven or so years worth of data that we have for that area. And during those surveys, um, which are a combination of aerial surveys and ground-based counts, we counted um, between 25 and 58 individuals in the Año Nuevo area. But a study by my colleague, Sophia Lyon, who I'm sure some of you have met, she was a graduate student at uh, San, Fran uh, San Francisco, University of San Francisco. Um, and she was recently studying um, sea otters around Año Nuevo. And she was conducting monthly counts of otters in the Año Nuevo area. And she found an average of about 70 otters uh, that were hanging out at Año Nuevo, at least uh, during 2020 and 2021. And I do, uh, the, the figure on the left here shows the areas where um, the animals were seen most consistently resting, which is a little bit different from the use of the, the habitat that they use for foraging. But this is pretty much where the groups were seen when they, uh, when they were counted. And I will note that um, a lot of the groups do have females with pups in the group. So it's not just males that are hanging out up there. Um, Sophia also studied the diet of the otters at Año Nuevo, so she used a high-powered spotting scope to make foraging observations, and what she found was that cancer crabs specifically, but crabs in general, dominated the sea otter diet at Año Nuevo, followed by urchin and then clams. And this is a really interesting finding because it's the highest percentage of crab in the diet of any geographic area that has been studied um, for sea otters, much, much higher than a lot of other areas. So that's super interesting. Um, and what's even more interesting is when I was preparing for this talk, I dove into the stomach content data from stranded sea otters that we've examined from Año Nuevo. And I found that 95% of the sea otters that were stranded, recovered stranded at Año Nuevo that had identifiable stomach content had crab in the, in the gut. Um, so it, it's really cool when the different types of data um, support each other and corroborate their findings. And the second most common prey item that I found uh, when I looked through the data, the prey database um, for the stranded sea otters was urchin. So it matches really well with the, the behavioral observations and that, that Sophia observed. Um, she found that the average dive time for otters at Año Nuevo during their foraging dives was 51 seconds, and that the average prey capture success rate was about 61%. So about 61% of the dives, um, they were successful in bringing up a prey item. And what, the reason I brought up the dive time and prey capture success rate is because um, we look at that as a measure of resource availability. So in, in areas where there's a lot of resources, the animals can, pre, they usually have short dive times and a high uh, capture success rate. And um, so the, the, to put these, the, these numbers into context, they're kind of intermediate for, diff, for other sites where we have good data for where animals have um, are at high density and have existed a long time and areas where animals are at low density and have been more recently occupying that area. So um, it's a really interesting finding. Um, to look a little bit more specifically at sea otter strandings that occurred um, around Año Nuevo. And for this data, I did include up to Gazas Creek and down to Bradley Beach. Uh, that was kind of the area that I considered Año Nuevo for pulling this data. And if we look back to 1975, I've got year on the x-axis here and number of stranded sea otters on the y-axis. 
and I've got it broken down by live stranded in orange and dead stranded in blue. And you can see that it's pretty variable how many strandings there are per year. The record was uh, 12 animals in a year and some some years there were only one there's only ever been one live stranding per year we've never had more than one live stranding in a year in that area um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of how often i'm, I'm up there um, picking up carcasses <laughs> and um a lot of people i think assume because because males tend to be the ones that expand the range um you tend to think of them as as being on the range extent. And since Spanya Nuevo it is near the northern range extent, you might expect that there to there to be a lot of males there. But as we learned with the population census counts, there's lots of female groups at Anya Nuevo, and we see that in the stranding um, data as well. Although we do find more stranded males than females. So this figure shows age class on the x-axis and the number of stranded sea otters on the y-axis. And it's broken down by different age classes of sea otter. And um, as you can see, for almost every age class, there's more males than females that are um, collected in the, the stranding record. And uh, this is based on 225 strandings between 1975 and 2021. Now, what are the causes of strandings <laughs> that we see? So this is just looking at the the 225 animals that we've examined from Anyo and or the Anyo area. And as you can see, shark bite is the most common cause of death. And there's a lot that are that are listed as unknown. And the reason why so many are listed as unknown, which might not surprise you guys, is a lot of the times, even if I get out there as quickly as I can, they are scavenged very, very quickly. So sometimes I'll get down there and the carcass will be completely fresh, but the um, the coyotes and the turkey vultures have absolutely just stripped every bit of tissue off of it. So we do have a pretty high percentage of unknown causes of mortality. And sometimes we don't know what the cause of mortality is for sure, but we can at least say whether the animal had any trauma or not. Um, and so that's what those two, second two categories are, unknown with trauma and unknown without trauma. Um, but as I said, the, the most common cause of, of death that we find is shark bite. And that is part of the reason why we think that sea otters are having a hard time expanding their range naturally farther north um, because so many of them are bit by sharks. And we only have, um occasionally we find um, some evidence of um of what kind of shark um, is biting them so the the picture that i show here it's, it's a pretty clear shark bite on that on that animal but a lot of the the cases that we see the the wound pattern is not that clear and um so we have to use other clues to tell us whether it was a shark bite or a the boat propeller or something else that caused um, those lacerations and wounds. And so one of the things that we look for is um, is evidence of the shark, uh, that there was actually a shark involved. And we find um, sometimes shark teeth fragments that are broken off in the wounds. And we also find scratch marks on the bones of the sea otters from where the shark teeth made contact. And we have only ever found evidence of one species of shark biting sea otters, and that's the white shark. They have serrated teeth, and um, they're the only species of shark in California that, that we know of that has serrated teeth, and that's the, the only type, the only teeth that we've ever found inside a sea otter are serrated, and we'll often find parallel scratches on the bones of the sea otters made from those serrations on the shark teeth. So while it's possible that other species of shark could be biting sea otters. We don't have any documentation that that's true. So as far as we know, all shark bites on, um, on sea otters are caused by white sharks. And um, an interesting thing is that in the case of sea otters, it's a case of non-consumptive predation where we don't have any evidence that the shark is actually consuming any part of the sea otter. We don't see chunks of tissue missing. Um, and there's never been sea otter remains documented inside 
the, the stomach of a white shark that has stranded or, or otherwise died. And so what we believe is that these are investigatory bites where the shark is essentially mouthing the sea otter and biting in, getting a lot of fur and no blubber and deciding it's probably not waste, worth wasting that, the time and energy to eat something that's um, so uh, cal calorically uh, low and, and hairy. So unfortunately, it's often fatal for sea otters, um, but it, it creates a really interesting management issue because here we have one protected species that is really having population level effects on another protected species. So it, it creates an interesting situation. All right, so I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So um, I'll just wrap up with letting you guys know that you can be essential partners in helping us learn more about sea otters by reporting stranded sea otters that you find either at Año Nuevo when you're there during your shift or if you're just at the beach with your family or uh, any other circumstances. So as I mentioned, we respond to every report of live or dead sea otter. It's helpful to us if you report it as soon as possible, because as you know, tide can come up, wash things away, um, scavengers can get there and, and <laughs> remove all the evidence that we, we need to figure out the cause of death. So the, the sooner we hear about it, the sooner we can get there and the better assessment we can make. I've got some contact numbers listed here for both live and dead sea otters. And the types of information that are helpful for us include the GPS coordinates, either the actual, if you're standing right there, or estimated from Google Maps. Um, you can use like, like a, Google, a drop pin in Google Maps um, to record the, the coordinates, um, the closest access point to the beach. Um, I'm often carrying these animals and they can weigh upwards of 50 or 60 pounds. So I prefer to, to go on at the closest access point so I don't have to carry them as far. Um, it's helpful to know if they're above the high tide line. That kind of lets me know how quickly I need to get there. And if you are in a position to, uh, where you have gloves um, and can do it safely and you're able to pull the animal above the high tide line, um, that's always helpful. It's helpful for me to know if you see tags on the animal and the animal that's shown here does have some flipper tags. Um, I'm gonna, in, in just a second, tell you a little bit more about those tags. And then um, it's helpful to know the relative size of the animal so I can prepare myself mentally for how big of a load I'm gonna be carrying. So a little bit more about tags. Um, uh, I've got a couple different examples here of, of similar looking tags for different types of animals. So in the upper left, I've got a fur seal. Um, they tend to be tagged uh, kind of in their armpit under, under their um, front flipper. In the bottom left, I've got a harbor seal, the harbor seal um, or a tag on its hind flipper, and then a sea otter with tags on the webbing of the hind flipper. So the otters typically have two tags, one in each uh, hind flipper. And um, you'll see in the bottom right picture, it's, it's a, maybe a little bit hard to see, but it shows a tag hole for an animal that used to have a tag, but the, the tag came out. And so I'm always looking, as soon as I collect the animal, I'll spread the flipper webbing to see if there's a hole that indicated the animal used to be tagged. Um, because basically for tagged animals, we wanna figure out everything we possibly can that happened to that animal because we have a lot of information about that animal before it died. So it's helpful to know when you report if you see tags, because that'll help us prioritize um, getting that animal very quickly. And finally, uh, photos are really helpful. Um, in this day and age, I very rarely have to go out to an animal um, that I haven't verified the species from a photo. I used to go out to a lot of opossums and fur seals, other things that people mistook for sea otters. But now that everybody carries a camera in their pocket all the time, um, it really has helped with verifying species before we respond. So if you are so if you are making a report, it's really helpful to have photos that just show what species it is. So of the teeth, of the head, um, or the the flippers and tail. Um, photos that show landmarks or something about the location in the background are really helpful for when I'm out there trying to find it. 
and um, something that gives indicates the size. So a, a shoe in the in the picture or something can be really helpful as well. And I will just end with um, what what I told you about at the very beginning, which I promised I would get to, is that there is one particular sea otter that um, she doesn't really follow the rules when it comes to female sight fidelity. Um, this picture is of sea otter 841. She was a rehab otter and um, was released in the Monterey or Moss Landing area in 2020 and immediately swam up to Santa Cruz. And we thought she was going to be a resident of Santa Cruz until she disappeared and was um, relocated up at Año Nuevo. And um, so that was pretty interesting. And then last year, um, that, so that was in 2020. In 2021, she showed up back in Santa Cruz. So we thought, okay, she's she's back home in Santa Cruz. And then she went up to Año again. And so you, you guys may have seen me up there in the last year or two tracking her when she goes up to Año. She usually takes off around September. So I expect her to go up there anytime now if she continues her trend of going up there. And um, it's great to know if you guys see her up there. So she has a light blue flipper tag on her left, um, on her left flipper. And um, I'm, I'll probably see you up there as soon as, as she takes off. I tracked her yesterday and she was still in Santa Cruz. So she hasn't gone yet. And um, it would be, yeah, it'd be great if you guys are out there with your scopes and binoculars and you see an animal with a light blue tag, if you could let me know, um, we'd love to, love to know what she's doing. So with that, um, I will just end on this screen, which has some additional resources about sea otters. Um, there's some cool resources for identifying um, pinnipeds and sea otters based on their skeletal features. And, um, a, a publication, a link to a public, an open access publication about the causes of mortality of sea otters. And I've got my email there uh, if you have questions. So with that, I will stop talking.